All right, so this is awesome because we got an extra 10 minutes for the, the early birds. And so I think we should dive into just a little bit of work together to get centered because for years I've been, it's been kind of driving me crazy. You can imagine 17 years in academia, all these sports specialties, all this stuff. And then this computer programmer comes along, convinces us all that coffee is the new superfood and creates this huge movement. I'm like, a computer programmer, really? Like, <laughs> shot past all the docs, everything else, creates this huge new movement. And so I've always like wondered like, Dave, like what the hell, like who channeled this to you and why? Because I'm pretty sure it's not about the coffee. Like there's something bigger afoot. And when the Vasper team gave me the opportunity to come and join you guys here, um, it just suddenly kind of crystallized in my mind that whether Dave likes it or not, it's not about the coffee, it's about this. It's about at the tipping point of tyranny, at the tipping point of a growth of an imperial medical military complex, at the tipping point of human consciousness, we get to come together. Every product in this place, every machine you sit on, everything you put in your mouth, I believe it was actually designed, channeled, put in place, so that we would all be together. It's not about the products. It's about the souls that are in these rooms. It's about people that are clear on who they are. And so when we sit down together, there's an opportunity to shift this freaking paradigm that we're in. Because most people are not taking the opportunity. Most people are in damage control. They're in full out sympathetic fight or flight. And I've recently gotten very immersed in a number of channels from the 1980s and to more recent that were channeling information about this moment, 2017 to 2027, that decade. We are at the end of a 50,000 year epoch in, fam in this family history that we call human. 50,000 year cycle is wrapping up and there's a 10 year gap that they speak of before the next 50,000 years begins. And you showed up right now. Who are you? That gets me pretty intrigued, honestly, because none of you are who you think you are. And I, I think we have the opportunity to start tapping into something way bigger than anything that we would call biohacking or functional medicine. Everybody keep coming in, you're fine. There's something to tap into that's fundamentally the fabric of the universe, something deeper than anything that we could see in a plastic off-gassing building full of plastic off-gassing marking materials, everything else that we do to communicate. We can even turn communication into toxicity, right? We create plastic paper, which is really weird, right? Like plastic covered paper to communicate and then we create 5G and we have a way of making everything toxic. I was sharing here a little bit of experience that I just came back from the Amazon rainforest with the Achuar tribe, which was the very last indigenous people to engage Western civilization, 1996. And they were the very first indigenous people to proactively engage the West. So they started dreaming a few Westerners into their reality. And Lynn Twist, uh, founder of Pachamama Network, if you've ever heard of her name, she's an angel among us. Lynn started having invasive dreams in her work with the Hunger Project, trying to end world hunger in Africa and the like. And she started dreaming these indigenous faces. And these faces were very invasive. They were speaking to her urgently and she couldn't understand their language and it was disrupting her sleep. And she was traveling among African nations and ended up in the Middle East and these dreams kept coming. So she started talking to people. Nobody knew what they were. She didn't know where they were from, who these peoples were. And as fate would have it, uh, a friend of hers invited her uh, into the rainforest for the first time. She's like, well, that's, that's not where people are starving, but I guess that's where I can go for some in interesting holiday. So they take buses to the edge of the rainforest, then bush planes into the rainforest, and then boats up the, the headwaters of the Amazon. And she climbs out of the boat with a friend, and out of the woods comes the faces that she's been dreaming. And they introduce themselves to Lynn and said, we've been dreaming you into our reality. Because your world needs to redream itself quickly, or you will kill all of us. 
The Achuar people have a 40,000 year verbal history, just like the Aboriginal communities in, in Australia. Imagine living on the same piece of Mother Earth for 40,000 years. Imagine your generational intelligence that starts to come out of something like that. And what starts percolating up through that 40,000 year history with people and products and things is deep wisdom from Mother Earth. And if you've been following what my lab has been working on in the last 10 years and everything else, we've decided that you know, our brand has become the intelligence of nature because it dumbfounds us every freaking day. So when you find a great product here, I want you to remember that the word biohacking is a misnomer, right? There is nobody who is ever going to hack nature. Nature is far smarter than we have given her credit for. And she will frankly fuck you up. <laughs> and, the, and I need you to hold on to that today, because I'm going to show you some crazy cool science, exciting stuff around a technology that I'm excited about. But if we don't keep bringing it back to this deeper thing, is that we, wherever you're from, and the Oshawar people are one. We are one, and we are ready to engage. We are ready to come into coherence. There's a vibration that's starting to gong under the, under the surface of the tyranny, under the surface of the control, under the surface of the darkness that, that tyrannizes our fear. There's a gong that's being struck, and it's making you vibrate. And excitingly, predicted for this 10-year period between 2017 and 2027, is a change in the human genome. Because it was predicted that it would not be macroeconomics that would be our downfall, because it sure looks like it. Money drives everything. We've got that wisdom in us. We've learned that. But it's not the money, we're told, by these channels. They said, it's actually your genetics. The genetics of the human species has left you a frail and vulnerable species because it is driven by fear. And fear, when it touches the human genome, changes our macro structure. It makes us vulnerable to coercion, compliance, manipulation. And so when you scratch your head and look around, you're like, what the hell is going on? Why am I the only one who is a little bit nervous about this situation? <laughs> Why are all my neighbors socially pressuring me to do something that seems insane? What is that feeling in me? The feeling is you wanting to jump to a new genetics. The sensation is newness that's never happened in our species before. Are we ready to step up? We're in, right? You can feel it in your bones. You can feel it in your skin. We are ready to shift everything, and it will be everything. And so to begin that journey, as people keep filtering in, we're going to start shifting this space. And one of my favorite events that we did just shortly before the whole pandemic was uh, called Future Well. Uh, I always get my California a little bit screwed up, but I think it was Northern California that we were at. And uh, Paul Hawkins and I got to speak for the first time together. We were big fans of each other, talked on, online before, but we got on stage and had like no time to prepare anything. So we had absolutely no idea what we were going to say. So we got up there together and started this fireside chat going back and forth. And if you've ever sat with Paul Hawkins, he's like listening to a savant, right? He's like kind of nonlinear, bounces all over the place, has kind of this m mumbling kind of thing where you're trying to keep up with sheer genius. He's got these just pearls that are dropping out, dropping out, and suddenly one dropped that I had to stop him and go back. It's like, you said this under your breath, and we have to state this out loud. He said, what's happening right now is we are practicing the future for those that will become awake. What's happening right now is we are practicing the future for those that will become awake. Still gives me goosebumps every time I say it. And so let's practice the future for those that will become awake together right now. We're being called to do this. You didn't show up here by accident to this talk or to this planet or to anything. You are freaking on purpose. You're frighteningly on purpose. There's nothing that can stop you, even your own self, which is your biggest barrier, right? You cannot stop yourself now. We are on a hurtling approach to transforming humankind. And you guys are here to do it. So let's close our eyes. Let's ground in. 
My mic is definitely on. Should we see if it's... Yeah, yeah, please crowd them all in. Yeah. Yeah. Test, test. Is that okay there? Can you hear me there? Can you hear me there? Too loud? Too quiet? Good? Too much? Boop. That good there? All right. Everybody's still trying to pound in. This is so important, we should probably wait until everybody settles in here, another minute or two. But as we start to think about what this is going to feel like, we'll do just a short guided meditation as people get settled in. And we're going to freaking gong a bell so loud that we wake up some species elsewhere too. All right? We're going to wake them up and let them know that we're showing up. And we're going to stop screwing up this planet. And we came to play. And we came to play. We're going to tell the jaguar of the rainforest. We're going to tell the anaconda. We're going to send a deep, sincere apology to all of this nature. And then we'll bring it back in for a request to engage, a request to step into coherence with something profound. When Lynn Twist and her colleagues first went to the rainforest in 1996 and made contact with the Oshawa tribe, women were completely silent in this tribe. If, a, if one of their own tribe came over to visit, the women sat in the background, they served chicha, but they would never say anything to another non-family member you know, without direct engagement from her husband. It was awesome to see and to sit with the current vice president of the Oshawa tribe, who is a 29-year-old woman. Since 1996, that tribe has woken up to realize that the journey we're in right now is the awakening of the feminine archetype. The feminine is waking up, and that's how it's all going to straighten itself up. So if that tribe can make that kind of social revolution in just a few short decades, one that we've frankly struggled to do today, to bring forward women of power without forcing them to be in the masculine archetype to do so, the Oshawa is showing us how fast we can change our mindset, how fast we can empower the feminine archetype. And the reason they were so fast at this is because they prophesied it. And so some couple hundred years ago, it was prophesied that at this moment, starting around 2012 to 2017, the second wing of humanity would start to open up. It's the story of the condor and the eagle. And the eagle wing, the masculine, has been beating trying to keep us afloat. And a bird with one wing flies what course? We have been fly flying in a spiral, downwards frankly, trying to keep humanity afloat with a masculine wing. And starting in 2012, the condor would start spreading its wing. And for the first time, humanity would fly straight. That's a great promise. That's the kind of transformational thing that's going to happen to shift what looks like sheer defeat, impossible odds. For some reason, we know the hero's journey. It's in every film we've ever made. It's in every book we've ever written. The hero's journey is what we are engaged in as humanity. And at the moment when we are at the gates of Mordor, and somebody rides down the line, clashing his swords against all of the spears. He says, there may be a day where we give up to tyranny, where we line up to give up our health freedom, where we line up to give up food independence, where we line up to give up the health and future of our children, but it is not this day. And so we will take the call of Paul Hawkins and say, today we are going to practice the future for those that will become awake. So close your eyes, put your feet straight in front, in front of you, uncross your legs if they're crossed, square up your shoulders, gently push your chest open, open that heart chakra, take a deep breath in and out. Set your vision on the horizon. And then relax your eyes with the realization that you no longer have to strain for that future on the horizon, but it's here right now. Relax your eyes as you realize the horizon is here now. Relax your face. 
and let's watch Mother Nature intertwine herself with all of our technologies, all of our architecture, the design of everything that we build in this building, all the biohacking tools and everything else. What would Mother Nature do with those tools? How would she wrap herself, intertwine herself? How would the vines grow up among those to make a more intelligent connection with her? Let's start reimagining our field of innovation and health technology in the context of a nature that is always nurturing and is waiting to unfurl that feminine wing. And then let's imagine the school systems for our children. Let's imagine the future that will become bright. Let's imagine the sound of laughter. Let's imagine the feeling of wildflowers pounding between your toes when you run across a meadow. Let's imagine the sound of waterfalls vibrating through your body, pounding out the fear. Let's imagine the future for those that will become awake, that are waking up right now. The tyranny is a facade. Humanity is rising. We will do it in spirit, even when not in body. We will rise. And we'll do this together. We will discover the law of one. The vine, the bird, the fox, humanity. We run through the fields together for a brighter, more coherent future. Deep appreciation to each one of you who showed up right now in physical body. You picked this moment to completely screw up the common paradigm, to shake it up, to smile on your face and joy in your heart. You're here to do something different. And I'm grateful to each of you for your courage, for your independence. But I also want to recognize that the rugged independence that has gotten us here as founders of companies, founders of products, founders of stuff, founders of ideas, founders of knowledge, we need to give up that identity because rugged individualism will never f take us to the law of one. We need to recognize the power of community. We need to start welcoming each other back into our lives again. And not just stepping across the divide of social distancing, but stepping across the divide of ego, of fear, of insecurity. We're going to step in together to create a bright future. It is such an honor to know so many of you. And I'm excited to know more of you through spirit, mind, body, all the rest. Thank you for getting us started. We're ready to jump in when you are. Let's just stand up and applaud one another. Freaking awesome. You guys are rocking it. Humans, come on, louder. Let's get it going. We're freaking alive. We're awake. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. So I'm going to dive into some science around Vasper. Peter, do you want to stand up? I want to honor you. Peter is an incredible inventor of this technology. Uh, Sebastian, his son, Sebastian, you want to stand up where you're at here? These two men, give them applause. There's something amazing when a father and a son share a vision and work their freaking asses off for decades to bring something forward for a humankind. Thank you both for an incredible gift that you've given us in the science that we go through today. Your work is transformational. Get to know Peter. Every great inventor always invents the thing that he invented for himself first. And he did that. His health transformation journey is awesome to know. You guys can sit down if you want, or you can stand up the whole time because he deserves <laughs> All right, we're going to jump in here. So what, what's going on? If, if you followed any of my science, my passion has become over the years to, as soon as tell, somebody tells me there's a waste product, I go rushing there to close the gap. Because nature does no waste. She knows no broken cycle. It is regenerative 
to its fabric, to the atomic level, there is never a wasted electron. It is infinite energy. And all energy is information. And all information is for the purpose of connection to achieve that law of one. We're here together. And so what's going to happen as we start to look at this technology is we're going to start to peer into what makes a body run. And what are the waste products that we were led to believe when it comes to exercise physiology that when we rush into that space of waste, we find out a great promise. And that's what I've found every time with ION, the product we've been working on for all these years. We were told there was a waste product from bacteria and fungi. And I was like, what is the likelihood that bacteria and fungi would take the effort to make a waste product? There's no way. So we started studying that stuff. And as soon as we took a sterile Petri dish of cancer cells and introduced a communication network from bacteria and fungi that was a waste product, and, but we started to realize it was able to exchange hydrogen and oxygen in a very high speed, something called redox chemistry. And when we put that communication network back into a sterile Petri dish, we saw human cells do things that had never happened before. We have a, in our science team at our, our biotech company, we have like 160 years of science under microscope in, in our scientists, and none of them had ever seen anything like this before. Because up until that moment, we believed that humans and human cells defined our experience. To only find out that human cells cannot connect, cannot regenerate, cannot rejuvenate, unless they are fueled or connected by a wireless communication network made by bacteria and fungi. And so the revolution that we're now in, the reason there's this dichotomy of narratives happening that we're all dying from this attack virus to we are resilient, we have an immune system, the separation between those two worlds is the last 30 years of science that has proved that at the center of human health is not the human cell. That is so disruptive, destructive to current paradigms that it's going to take us centuries, if not eons, at our current rate of progress to embrace that. And we're going to keep treating ourselves with our diseases and everything else as if we are an isolated species. But the second law of thermodynamics is potent, and it always works. The second law of thermodynamics is that any system put in isolation increases its chaos. And so what's happening on the planet right now? The isolation of the human species. We are doing it through herbicides and pesticides, number one. We are eliminating the very fabric of how we connect to Mother Earth. And as we lose the wireless communication network between ourselves, we become disconnected at the cellular level. And we, we lose our self-identity at the cellular level, we lose our self-identity here at that Christ chakra. We lose it up here at the God chakra. We lose track of our own soul purpose, and we start to wonder why we're here. Suicide goes flying up in our farmers. Cancer goes flying up in our farmers because the cells within their bodies have forgotten their own origin and are now become a cancer, deep, unawares of the bigger thing that it's in. We have done the same thing with exercise physiology, and Vasper's here to reconnect that. In exercise, we have come to believe this is something we have to do to the body, but I'm here to tell you that exercise is innate in the body. It is something that is constantly happening. As you sleep flat on the bed, your body is in an incredible exercise machine. And in its exercise, it's creating downstream communication information because all energy is infinite and all energy is communication. It's information for the purpose of connection. So we're going to take a look at physiology from that perspective. These, this technology basically combines three very well-proven concepts. The first is compression. The second is a shift in circulation, a, a change in the, in the matching of arterial versus uh, venous blood flow. And the third is cooling of the core body temperature during exercise. And so we're going to take a look at the compression science first. It's been long recognized, this is some of the more recent data in 2017, but you can, you can run this stuff back in the 1950s that people were realizing if they compress muscle during exercise, they got all kinds of interesting impact. Leg compressions done under a, a compressive cuff was increasing the circulating lactate at VO2 max by 11%. I'm sorry, reducing it in peripheral circulation by 11%, and at 10 minutes post-exercise, down by 18%. And we've been told about lactate that this is a waste product, right? Lactic acid is a classic waste product, right? For the last 50 years, we've been told that. And the interesting realization is that lactate is not at all a waste product. And I want to lift up George Brooks. When you meet a PhD who's been screaming at the world that they're wrong for 40 years and he keeps doing it, you got to be impressed. 
Like at some point, you're just like, humans don't even deserve to know this stuff. Like you just <laughs> give up, right? If they can't grasp this thing, and George Brooks has been screaming at the world, UC Berkeley biology, freaking brilliant mind, that lactic, lactate is actually the holy grail of energy metabolism at, the, at not just the muscle level, but also importantly at the neurologic level. Lactate is the breakdown product of glucose. And we're told when something breaks down, we always assume it's a waste product. So everybody knows everything runs on glucose at the cellular level. You can also run on fatty acids. Your mitochondria like both of those. But it turns out that as soon as you go under high demand exercise, whether it be a neuron, especially a neuron that's been suddenly injured, whether you have a concussion or you have a stroke event, you have oxygen deprivation of a muscle, you quickly take the glucose and you turn that into lactate. And the assumption was that was just the process of releasing ATP from glucose to drive mitochondrial metabolism, create energy. But it turns out that you don't actually get lactic acid unless you are out of oxygen at the liver. So as long as you're oxygenated at the liver, you never ferment lactate, and it just turns right back into glucose at the liver. Lactate is now thought to be somewhere between six and 10 times more efficient as a superfuel at the muscle level and at the neuron level under high metabolic demand than glucose. And so this is the body's way of creating basically nitrous. I'm, I used to do drag racing, and so when you hit that button, you get nitrous into that, that fuel line. It's insane what happens, right? Same pistons, same engine, and suddenly you have 3,000 RPM jump because you have a super fuel in there. That's what lactate is doing. Leave it to Western medicine to make you terrified of the very thing that could heal you, right? We're so good at doing this, and we do it over and over again. Cholesterol causes heart disease, right? 40, 50 year dogma, viruses cause disease, right? 10 to the 15 viruses in my bloodstream right now. 10 to the 15. Billions of viruses in my bloodstream right now in perfect balance with my nature. So when somebody says there's a waste product, it gets suspicious. Compression garment promotes muscular strength recovery after resistance exercise. And so this is cool. This is pre and then hours post exercise looking at the uh, chest compressions up top, uh, so it's basically bench press, and then at the bottom, you're looking at the leg extension and quadriceps primarily tested there. And so in the black, you're using compression. In the white, you've got control. And so at each point, starting you know, really during exercise, but especially at one hour and all the way out to 24 hours after, you've got this advantage. And so the exciting thing about VASPR, when you start to think about compressing muscle during exercise, it's that it's not limited to that 22 minute workout on the bike. It's gonna actually extend your bio biologically for a half-life that's more than a 24 hour period. And you'll see some of the data in the clinical trials later about the neurologic impact. And I'm gonna take a look at central cardiovascular stuff on the next section as well. It's, it's exciting to know that you're creating a durable response, a durable regenerative cycle being reconnected. And we see this in farming all the time. Farmer's Footprint, if you haven't seen that, is our nonprofit. We've been working with farmers to help change their mindset of, I need to stop killing everything, and I need to start fostering life. Literally, every morning when a farmer wakes up in the Midwest, he thinks, what do I have to kill today? They'll tell you this. And they hate getting on the hazmat suit. They do not like mixing six toxic chemicals and then spraying this all over their food. They don't like doing it. It's terrifying. It's disgusting. They're in freaking Tyvek half the day. They're sweating their balls off. They don't want to be doing that, but they're told that's the only way to do it. And if you go into an ICU with me, you're going to find out we do exactly the same thing. I wake up every morning, what do I have to kill today? What cancer cell do I have to kill today? What antibody, what microbe do I need to kill today? You know, what blood pressure do I need to suppress today? It's all about this reactionary, fear-driven, genomic shift. This is why we cannot vibrate at the higher levels because of the genes that we have that are driven by fear. And so you guys are here to break out of that fear for a moment and shift the genetics of our species so we can vibrate at the higher level. So I get excited about compression because it's so damn simple and it tells us something about the regenerative nature of health is that once you stimulate biology, it keeps going at a stimulated rate. It doesn't need to be force fed. And so when somebody is telling you you need NAD IVs or whatever it is, it's not that they're wrong about NAD biology. The only problem is the biology was never there to handle 10,000 times the NAD in a three minute period ever. And it's a reductionist belief about one of the most extraordinary symphonies that we've ever discovered, which is called human life. 
a symphony of 70 trillion cells that are then working with 1.4 quadrillion microbes. It's then working for 14 quadrillion mitochondria. What does an NAD drip do to that? What does a vitamin C infusion do to that? Humble yourself when you approach human physiology. After my decades of science, I wake up every morning more dumbfounded, more in awe, more a sense of, I, gotta, I need to get the fuck out of this equation because I'm messing it up. <laughs> and just let nature do her thing. Let her unfold that other wing. Let the condor fly us straight. As scientists, as consumers, we need to start to really start asking ourselves, what are we doing? And at the very best, we're doing a bunch of Band-Aids. And so I am looking for technologies that reconnect us to a trust in our own physiology. Because if we stop fearing these bodies and start embracing the fact that they've been regenerating since the second we were born, it changes your mindset and you start welcoming stuff in. I'd spent all day flying yesterday, super just junked out, and last night sleeping in this Airbnb that was like off-gassing 30,000 tons of Clorox, and this amazing scene, I was just like, holy cow, I might not make it through the night. <laughs> and I'm laying there at like two o'clock in the morning, just thinking like, what am I gonna do? What, how is, and then I just, laid back into this realization that my body's regenerating right now. The stressors I'm putting on it are stimulating a regenerative pathway. And it just changed my mindset immediately. And suddenly I was like, thank you, Clorox. Thank you. Thank you for bombing my entire microbiome right now. Thank you for annihilating my entire epithelial surface of my lungs. You are inspiring a massive regenerative event. Thank you, Clorox. And I felt so much better an hour later. I felt this big shift happen in my body because I started to see everything as the story I was writing, my own narrative of regeneration and reconnection. So when we find technologies that can make trust happen in the body again, that you don't need an infusion of nitric oxide, you can make that stuff right there. It changes your mindset. So 22 minutes on Vasper, I invite you guys to get over there and just try it so you can feel, like, feel what regenerative health looks like. What is your body capable of creating right now? What super fuels lie within you? I don't think we can create any more powdered weird things to put in our bodies. And then next year always happens, I'm like, holy shit, I was wrong. So many powdered weird things that we can put in our bodies. Superfood this, superfood that. It's being made in your body right now. The ultimate fuels, the ultimate intelligence is right within you. We need to reconnect to that intelligence and trust that for a moment, lose the fear of ourselves and move forward. All right, the second technology here, this one is really near and dear to my heart. I haven't even gotten to talk to you, Peter, about this too much, but one of the heartbreaking events that really started to shape who I became was in the, in the early 2000s, like 2003 to 2006, something like that. I was at the University of Virginia working in the ICUs, seeing people dying of all kinds of stuff, mostly cardiovascular disease and cancer. And there was a new technology called extracorporeal compression that had just come out, and we were one of, the, one of the clinical trial centers for this thing. And the clinical trial was, because it was a new technology, it was reserved for only people that had completely failed all medical and surgical intervention for multivascular uh, death, basically. And so they have four vessel, five vessel cardiovascular disease, they've had three heart attacks, they've had 17 stents, they're just like out of options. Then they get to enroll in a trial where we simply just squeeze their peripheral muscles. Wow. That was it. Over the next three years, we saw the most bonkers things happening in this trial. We saw five vessel disease going away, clean catheterizations a few years later, and we only treated for a short period of time. So I just want to show you some of this data. This stuff is actually even more recent because they keep repeating this stuff because nobody believes it. So this is still 2018. We're still repeating this stuff to see if this is true, which is amazing to me. But the, the heart, one of the critical features of the heart's function is stroke volume. We used to think that the heart, and most 99.9% .9 of physicians still think it's a pump. Heart is not a pump. There's not nearly enough muscle in a, in a left ventricle to push the blood through your entire capillary tree. There's far too much resistance in your blood vessel to even handle that kind of pressure. The heart's not a pump. Weird. What is it? It's actually a vortex. It creates a vortices in there that's creating fluid dynamics in the blood. And then your blood slides simply through the vasculature with less resistance. So when you have a big heart attack and the, the pump, quote unquote, fails, what's happening is you've lost the dynamic 
vortex within that, that vascular environment and the blood is not getting restructured in its original math. And now it becomes highly resistant to go through the capillaries. Same thing that happens actually in plumbing. When you take water through a 90 degree bend in your house plumbing, it loses its ultrastructure. Water should never do a 90 degree turn. I see all the water people like freaking out, pumping their fists, like I told them. <laughs> Structure water people all over the place, pump your fists, you're right. That 90 degree bend, it takes away the energy. What happens in circulation is that nothing takes a 90 degree bend unless you lose the vortex. And you can do that in a number of different fashions. You can lose the vortex in even your veins as it flows back to the heart. The veins are the weirdest thing, right? There's no muscle in the wall of a vein. And so you gotta get blood from your big toe all the way back up to your heart without any muscular capacity in that vein. It's a passive tube. And so it does it brilliantly through the twisting of the vein itself. So the vein is designed to swirl the blood back up. So when you have compression from a skeletal muscle, when you move slightly, it squeezes the vessel, not just to, uh, like a, a compression like this, but in a twist. And it shoots up through the next valve and keeps accelerating until it gets back into your heart. Beautiful. The, this, the phenomenon of varicose veins is a loss of circulatory flow. So you're losing flow dynamics in both directions, heart attack or otherwise. So what they did was compress the, the peripheral legs. We always do it on the legs when we're doing EEC or the extracorporeal compression. And you squeeze the legs, and just after 30 minutes of squeezing the legs, you see increase in stroke volume. You see improved vortices within the heart. 30 minutes squeezing a leg, heart improves. And so what it tells us is that there is communication between the structured water in your legs and the structured water in your heart that we call blood flow. And so this started getting really wacky because we were starting to see age-old calcified plaques removing themselves from the cardiovascular system. So it's, it's, like I said, it's always end-stage heart disease. Everybody's got angina. And in the study, within just weeks, 50% reduction in angina was experienced by 76% of the, the patients in the study. There's no drug that's ever had that kind of success, not anywhere close, in patients with early heart disease. But these are people that have already failed multidrug therapies, revascularization, and everything else. And just compressing their limbs is shifting this phenomenon to get that, that vasculature moving in the right direction. The role of enhanced corporeal compression, again, looking at long-term studies, five-year major adverse cardiovascular events were significantly lower among those completing ECP, with 23% having a major cardiovascular event, which was either new refractory angina or heart attack or stroke, 23% compared to the control group, which is 86%. If you could eliminate 60% of vascular events in people, do you think that would be a breakthrough drug? But since it's just squeezing on the legs, this thing is last in the, in the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic's therapeutic things. If you go to the Cleveland Clinic website right now, I did last night, just double check before I promised it. Here in 2021, you go to Cleveland Clinic and you type in extracorporeal compression. It's gonna come up with their treatment algorithm. To get into the treatment, to get it paid by insurance, you had to have failed three years of medical therapy and revascularization by stents or cardiovascular bypass surgery. We need to reconnect to the trust in our bodies. Amen? We need to believe these things are healing machines. Peter, thank you for reminding us that these machines can heal. And so I get excited about this technology because finally we're going to bypass the freaking hospital systems and say, you know what? The consumers would like to be healthy. The consumers would like a heart that works. The consumers would like peripheral arteries that actually pump. Those consumers would like veins that return blood to the heart instead of pooling lymph and everything else in their low extremities, blowing out their venous things. We're done with that. Screw the Mayo. Screw Cleveland Clinic. We're going to get healthy. We're going to vibrate higher. We're going to create a new future. We'll do all that, right? Sorry to get on the soapbox occasionally. I'm preaching pre the choir, but I'm just trying to reinforce the vibration of hope inside of you the vibration of trust inside of you that your body freaking works. And it's just waiting for a little bit of nurture, a little bit of reminder of, I'm with you. I'm gonna co-create with you. And that's what I love about Vasper. It doesn't do anything to the body. It inspires the body to do what it does best by helping work with it. And so uh, this is another study showing basically the same thing. Um, 30, the point to this slide that I wanted to point out is our studies at UVA and the ones since then we're only 35 weeks long, so it's a little, little over six months in duration. And you just come in weekly and you do the treatment. Five years later, they still have 
the benefit. And so at five years, with only 35 weeks of treatment, then you stop for the next four and a half years, their output or their outcomes are still equivalent or better than five years of medical therapy or revascularization and surgery. What that tells you is you're turning on a regenerative mechanism in the body that continues. And that gets exciting with FASPR. You, you, you can help people not just be dependent on the technology. If you feel better on an NAD drip, your body is never going to produce that much NAD. And so you're going to come back in and get that again and again. I, I see people all the time who are coming to my clinic asking for this kind of drip or this kind of infusion. We don't do none. So we're not a very popular clinic because people freaking just want the drip. And we say, no, we got better stuff. It's called breath work, meditation, <laughs> exercise, nutrition. And they're like, shit, that sounds really hard. And so, <laughs> and so they, they reboot and they go do something else. And then they come back three or four years later. They're like, you know what? That exercise, nutrition thing is starting to sound pretty good. How do I go about that? And I'm excited about this technology because it gives people who have been stuck under the thumb of Western medicine for decades a leg up, literally. And the excitement that I have is a technology that can put you back in touch with a high functioning physiology in a very deconditioned body. And an example of this is, um, oh, well, I'll get to some examples at the end, I guess, because I still need to really include cooling. I want to focus on kind of what's happening with EECP. If you guys haven't seen the four minute workout, it's something we created like six or seven years ago. It happened to be like the most popular thing I ever put on the web. Like you, I do all this fancy ass stuff and it's always a four minute workout, it wins the game, right? It's free, you can do it in your clothes, you can do it butt naked, it doesn't matter. You just get up and you start moving and it works every time. And so what we designed is a four minute workout that dumps nitric oxide from all your peripheral vessels. Everybody's saying, let's do it right now. Um, but let me see what my, our time is because I'm going to get yelled at because they always go like, oh, 1240, we're doing all right. All right. You guys want to do a one and a half minute workout? Yeah. All right. Stand up. Put your feet apart, about shoulder width. And then what you're going to do is you're going to drop into the most comfortable squat you can. If that's just really shallow, it totally works fine. If it's a deep squat, that's great too. Find a comfortable squat and then come right back up. And the key here is going to do this fast because we want to run out of oxygen quickly and inspire all of our endothelium, which is the source for all of our nitric oxide, to dump that nitric oxide. There's a 30 second reservoir in your, in your endothelium that's ready to start dumping. So we're going we're to push pressure on that vascular lining. So 10 quick squats. When you get good at this, you can do 20, but I think 10 is going to get us there. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You look as ridiculous as you feel. That's great. And then we're going to go to the arms. It's a 90 degree swing. And you're going to try to do a hard stop at the top and bottom. With come right down to your side, all the way down to the side, 90 degrees. And we're trying to just pump those deltoids. And we're going to get the, the backs to you. Rhomboids, top of the back. You're going to push your chest out a little bit and squeeze your shoulder blades together to really get a good pump going. Feel that burn. All right, stop there. And then we're going to go this way, and we're going to do like a jumping jack without the jump. So just go straight up and down. Yeah, try not to punch somebody next to you. I see everybody troubleshooting. That's good. Excellent. Seven. I've been working you for a minute. And you're like, why am I so freaking stiff already? Like, what is going on? Is that damn lactic acid or something. You are making super fuel right now from nitric oxide. So nitric oxide hits and you start changing the dilation of all your vessels and you start making lactate, which is really exciting because you're making a super, super fuel. One last set. T typically you'll do 20 repetitions for three full sets, but we we're, we're saving time. So we're stop here at 10, eight, nine, 10, back to the arms. Chest out, squeeze those shoulder blades together. I'm biohacking my ass, you guys. <laughs> Everybody's like, ouch, ouch. <laughs> And that's 10 there and straight over the head, last set. Good job, you're rocking. All right, stop there. Hold, hold your hands at your sides. Close your eyes. Feel your fingertips, what do you feel? Tingling. Why isn't that happening three times a day? Right now, every single blood vessel in your body is accelerating its vortices. You're literally structuring your water right now. You're spinning faster, smarter, more connected. Every blood vessel is dilating. You're getting more oxygen and nutrients to everything because you just dumped nitric oxide from the 16 largest muscle groups in your body. 
relax and go ahead and sit down when you're ready. But that just made you younger. So feel your fingers again right now. Is the tingling going away? Yeah. Super short-lived. Why is that? Because your speed of your vascular return is so quick that it's whisking the nitric oxide out of the system very quickly. So it's a relatively short duration. I believe the most important thing about compression exercise, EECP to reverse cardiovascular disease and all this, is that when you put compression, you can pull the nitric oxide and lactate longer at the muscle or the brain as it needs it. So instead of whisking it back to my liver where I convert all of it back to glucose, et cetera, you can pool it. And you can hold the space of nitric oxide and lactate a moment longer. And when you do, you do something phenomenal. Somebody who's been suffering from chronic Lyme, chronic fatigue, chronic pain syndromes, and hasn't been able to get off the couch for five years, 10 years, you can take them back to a physiology of when they were 10, 15 years old. Because there's so much lactate and nitric oxide present at the muscle that they frankly don't have the physiology to do themselves. And so this is a huge tool to remind them that their body is regenerative. And they don't need the chronic Lyme clinic. They don't need me. They just need to start working within the regenerative capacity of their own body. This is a simple diagram, very simplified, of all the nitric oxide <laughs> pathways. You cannot biohack nitric oxide. That's my point of this slide. Nature is so freaking smart, right? There's over 2,000 genes that are affected by the presence of nitric oxide, and the majority of those are non-human genes. It changes the genomics of your mitochondria and, bizarrely, the gut mi bi microbi microbiome. And so nitric oxide is a trigger for this downstream event of regeneration that says, let's enrich the soil. And so the microbes start to proliferate. You can change your bowel flora by increasing the amount of nitric oxide in your peripheral ves vessels with the, that four minute workout or the 22 minute workout with Vasper, you get the hypercharged version of it. And so you're gonna work on getting nitric oxide to do its greatest work. Let me come over here for a second and I'm gonna show you, just spot it right here. Nucleus gene expression. So essentially what's gonna happen is your NAD drip is gonna stimulate this pathway right here and leave all of this behind. And we do that all the time in physiology. We think we found a shortcut. And what happens inevitably is when we do one thing in a symphony of thousands, we start to create imbalance. And this is the masculine archetype of health. There's a problem, I'm gonna fix that crap. The feminine approach, the feminine mindset that we all need to take on is there is a process, not a goal. Health is a process. It's never ending. You never check the box. Yep, did health. <laughs> but I guarantee you, we do that as men all the time. We step out of the gym, check box, did health today, whoo. Rest of the day, goes to shit. You go to synagogue, choo. bam, good Jew today. I am Christian, went to church. We check these boxes. Forgetting that life is a process, forgetting that spirit is a process, forgetting that being human, being alive is a, is a regenerative journey. So I want to connect you back to that. I want to give you a sense of joy in that. How boring would it be if it was a check of the box? How deflated would it be if somebody came up to you and said, the best you're ever going to feel is when 30 seconds after your NAD trip turns off. We are giving away our power every day, the things that nature just laughs at. Because she created the yucca root. She created a golden beet. She created the ayahuasca vine. She's there to mess up your paradigm. She's calling you to something bigger than a technology or something you extracted from one of her roots. Metformin, great one. So extract from a root sounds pretty natural leading cause of kidney failure in most of my patients, metformin. It screws up kidney metabolism because we do one thing and we come in and we disrupt everything saying this is going to fix it. We can shift everything. 
This is just a look at aging and endothelial dysfunction. And so this is just encouraging you, if you don't have advanced five vessel cardiovascular disease and you go sit on the VASPR, what you're gonna do is reconnect yourself to this anti-aging phenomenon that is one of the most poorly understood uh, physiologies still. This one's from 2015, and I actually may have missed the last sentence, which was like the best one. It looks like it's just off the bottom of the slide there, but the last sentence was, we have absolutely no idea of the mechanisms of, of the uh, aging of uh, endothelial cells. We don't know why it happens. We don't know what, why it occurs, but it dials in so well to the actual aging process is endothelial function. And so when we have a technology or when we learn a physiology of exercise that ties us back to this endothelial function, I bring attention to the middle line there. Genomic instability and senescence are present in older arteries. You can change the genetics of the artery of the vascular wall by increasing that lactate and nitric oxide in the wall of the vessel. You can regain that structured water thing. And I guarantee you this is what they're missing. The reason I keep saying, I don't know why endothelials are dysfunctioning. What's causing this, the senescence of endothelial cells? It's the damn structure of the blood. When you lose that, that slippery quality of blood and it starts to lose its energetics, it becomes stagnant, it becomes hard to push through a, a blood vessel, you start to tear up the endothelial cells. So I'm very excited because two of my colleagues at the University of Virginia, just in the last few years, this is the silver lining of the pharmaceutical industry and their idiocy, paid UVA to build a new model of, of endothelial uh, health testing because they wanted to develop a drug that would change the sheer uh, resilience of, of endothelial lining because that would be the holy grail of cardiovascular disease if they could find a drug that would improve the slippery nature of endothelial cells. Endothelial cells do not become rough because they want to. And that's what they think is happening. They're like, oh, well, we just need to make them smooth without asking why are they unsmooth? And so our, our group is putting it in a, a, a grant right now to, to see if we can show them that the pharmaceutical companies have the wrong thing. Because the pharmaceutical companies had stopped sending them drugs a number of years ago. And so the whole model is just sitting there on the shelf at UVA. And it's really damn cool. It's a spinning model. Basically, you can imagine a Petri dish that spins in high velocity and gets endothelial cells growing so you can get a high shear force of liquid across that surface. And we're going to show them that it's the structure of the blood and the, the actual intelligence of the microbes that are putting information into the bloodstream to structure that water that makes endothelial cells slippery. And so it's just a, a description of something exciting of like the short-sightedness of a pharmaceutical industry can be our greatest strength, can be a huge opportunity. And so when you see them rushing around, try to jab everybody with genetic engineering devices, I want you to really settle into the reality that this is our best opportunity. Because those of us that survive the next 10 years are gonna show something about the resilience of humanity that's never been imagined. Because in the process of stepping away and becoming the control group for humanity, we lost our fear for a moment. And losing that fear is what will change your genomics, which will restructure your water, which will change your flow of blood vessels, improve your circulation, and make you more resilient. So VASPR is a fun technology. You put all three of these together, and the third one is probably among the most effective things. And, and it's, this one is the easiest to conceive of, and so it's one of my favorites to think on. But the cooling that happens during VASPR, so the, the big cuffs that are on your thighs and the cuffs that are on your arms, they have adjustable pressures. So the thighs are typically set around 60 millimeters of mercury. The arms are typically set about 45. And you can adjust those up and down as, as to kind of how, how much intensity you want to put on your workout. But those are filled not with air like you would with a blood pressure cuff, a sigma monitor. Instead, it's filled with liquid. And so you got liquid cooling going through the cuffs, and so you're cooling your entire arterial tree in, in all four limbs during extreme exercise. You also have a cooling blanket that's on the whole bench of the, of the reclining seat there that's cooling your, your back and your buttocks as you're pumping along. There's also a, a, a wraparound collar that cools the, the blood to your brain as you're cycling, which I think is actually the most important thing. When I'm on VASPR, if I only had to do one cuff, I would do it to my brain because the one organ that I want to trick during this exercise is my brain. I don't want to, my brain to know that I'm working out. And I'll go into a little more detail there in a second. Skin blood flow in adult. So let's take a step back and just point out that max cardiac output, even a bunch of biohackers like you guys, are between 16 and 20 liters per minute. And as soon as you start sweating, as soon as you're, you vasodilate, you lose six to eight liters per minute of blood to your skin. Your muscle just lost 35 to 50% of its vascular potential. It's, so your VO2 max, your cardiac output, and its stroke volume and all that, just stole 
some 35 to 50 percent right off to your skin just to keep your core body temperature from rising. So when you lay down on Vasper and you start pumping, all that cold liquid flowing through, when you first get on it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is miserable. I don't like being cold when I work out. And then within <laughs> seconds, you adapt and your body's like, oh, I got it. I'm 98.6 degrees and whatever you're going to do and you're cranking along. And after a 22 minute workout, you still haven't burst out sweating. And then they lay you down brilliantly on a cooling table. And so you lay down a tool, uh, table that next to it, a massage table that's got a, a cooling jacket on that that cools your core body temperature for another 10 minutes while your heart rate returns to normal and the rest. By not vasodilating, you increase your VO2 max by 35 to 50%. To your muscle, to your brain. One of the reasons why this is so exciting to me is because of this. Dermal vascular dilation is entirely regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. And so when your body temperature starts to rise, you put your whole body into a fight or flight sympathetic response so that it will dilate your skin. Your best martial artists out there, what neural system are they dependent on when they are at fighting at their best? Parasympathetic, they are in flow state. Bruce Lee, the master. If, if you haven't looked it up, go ahead and freaking use Google if you have to, but duck, duck, go, please. Duck, duck, go, Bruce Lee, six inch punch. It shows him demonstrating to the Olympic like karate team back in the 70s or something like this. It's like a grainy black and white. But he takes his fist, pulls it back just six inches from this guy's chest, and he's standing there like talking to everybody. And then he punches forward just six inches, and this guy flies through the air and lands on this chair behind him. Bruce Lee knew how to stay in this completely relaxed state and dial into all energy. Energy is infinite. You're tied to it. But you've been disempowered from it. You've been disconnected from it. So I get very excited when I lie in bed in the midst of Clorox or anything else, and I say, ah, here's, here's an, an adversary. I'm going to go into my Bruce Lee moment. I'm going to punch a six-inch punch to the Clorox and just send all of my energy back out in the atmosphere and say, I'm here and this is my boundary. Don't screw with me. I'm here. I showed up on purpose. I'm here to change the common paradigm. I'm here to connect with every human being on this planet and say, I love you. I'm grateful for you. I want to change the world with you. That's where we need to stay in that sympathetic. So when you get off that cooling blanket, you're going to realize you just worked out harder than you have maybe in years. And the next morning you wake up with absolutely no stiffness because you never had to oxidize or ferment lactate to lactic acid because you pulled it in the muscle that was working. So you can work like crazy on Vasper and wake up the next day. You, you know it the moment you get off the table because you are in a total endorphin rush in a parasympathetic state. You may have never felt that. I don't necessarily dial into it the first time I'm on Vasper, but I recently was back in my clinic and did five days straight on Vasper. And by my third and fourth day, I finally was able to pinpoint what I was feeling. Oh my God, I'm in total parasympathetic relaxation, getting up off this massage table, and I have the full-blown endorphins of just having fought through a marathon. That 22 minutes on Vasper is equivalent to about two hours of hard car uh, cardio exercise. And as far as the amount of lactate you're gonna be able to digest, the amount of nitric oxide release, and the amount of compression you're gonna get on the muscles. So compression, circulation, cooling, you put them all together and you get some amazing things. There's been a lot put out there over the years about you know, improved muscle strength, all that stuff. I think that's missing the point. And so this is a clinical trial that they did at Vasper. Uh, this is looking at uh, 10 male pararescuers and they just did six weeks, uh, one week intervals on the Vasper. Oh, I'm sorry, they did uh, completed 20 Vasper exercises over a six week period. And in this study, they were able to show a 13% uh, increase in run time to exhaustion. So that's, aerobic exercise that's being affected long term by a compression. So this is new science for me because we, we know that we can improve muscle strength by doing all this lactate and all that. You get muscle bulking, you do all the super fuel stuff. But actually change respiratory function and cardio, it means you're doing the slippery blood vessel phenomenon. You're creating better flow through the entire respiratory tree. All of those capillaries that exchange oxygen and carbon, carbon dioxide, you're getting better vascular function throughout the entire tree there as well as the intravascular system that's exchanging that at the cellular level. But look at the heart rate recovery, 25% increase in the speed of heart rate recovery after exercise. That's a game changer. 
That is huge. That is a youthifying effect like few other things can give you. What's doing that? The body's own response to its own lactate and, and nitric oxide. It gets me so excited. You are a regenerative machine. The SF36, this is some very recent study that they did. The SF36 is one of the best standardized studies looking at quality of life. And look at just, this is a 12 week period, 14 uh, veterans in the military completed 24 VASPR exercise sessions, 21 minutes each, followed by the 10 minutes of lying on the cooling mats. And they reported just after that 12 week period, the 20, you know, 16% improvement in general health. But look at the energy and fatigue, 85% improvement in energy and fatigue levels. It's so exciting to see these veterans who are in the genomics of fear. And that's what we do. My brother was in, in Iraq for the whole surge and just horrific shit that he had to see doing that. And a lot of it had to do with American troops taking just an inordinate amount of just trauma. But a lot of it had to do with the trauma they were inflicting on civilians and everything else over there. And so he came back super traumatized. And so it's really near and dear in my heart when you do something to remind a veteran that they are empowered, that this is their boundary. No government can dictate the loss of their character. No government can, can give them damage and trauma at the soul level. Their soul is still free. Their soul remains untouched. And so when you find a veteran who is being reconnected to hope, you start to spark that, that origin again, that origin story. So thank you for picking the veterans on this study. Overall, social functioning was interesting. 25% improvement in social function. Imagine the downstream effects of that. Less isolation, syntropy happens. The opposite of entropy, the opposite of chaos. And so to imagine the hearts and minds of soldiers going into syntropy, going into social interaction again, is pretty darn exciting. This is again is just showing sleep. Uh, one of the things that Sebastian hears most uh, and all of his colleagues at the booth hear all the time is that as soon as somebody starts faster, they report better quality sleep. And there's, this is a bit of a, a mix here. So if your sleep's already pretty good, if your score is less than five, it means you've got good sleep. If it's over five, you have a clinical sleep disorder. And what you can see in this study is 100% of the people that had a clinical sleep disorder, scores at baseline greater than five, they all improved. People that had moderate to mild sleep disorders it was a bit of a mix in those first couple weeks because it can be very stimulating to the brain too. So if you're not in big sleep debt, you may actually feel more energized. So it's something to play with. It depends a little bit about your own personal physiology. But I would say if you have a severe sleep disorder, big sleep debt, you're gonna notice that shift quickly and see that sleep improvement happen. Sleep, by the way, it was the number one predictor of bad outcomes with COVID in my clinic. You had COVID after one, one month of no sleep. See that? I love it. So reverses from one month of COVID symptoms quickly, all this. But sleep is so critical to your innate immune system. Imagine maintaining 1.4 quadrillion relationships. That's what you're doing right now at the cellular system. That we call it a human immune system. That's complete BS. Nothing's human. It's all nature. There's a natural immune system that is superhuman. It goes beyond the human system. It's mostly reliant on the communication relationships to microbes in your, in your body. It takes a lot of energy to put all that together. And so you start losing sleep. I saw people getting really bad COVID that I couldn't put together. Like this is not the person in my clinic that I thought was gonna be really suffering here. I thought this person was in my top 1%. Sit down, what's going on? Dig deeper. Just went on a business trip, didn't sleep for four days, just went through a divorce, didn't sleep for two months, doing their drips, doing their IV drips, doing their workouts, horrible COVID because they just didn't sleep. So when you see sleep shift, it's way deeper than, oh, I just feel good. It's literally you reconnecting to your regenerative capacity, your ability to recoup and maintain relationships across the system that's as complex as the 1.4 quadrillion microbes and the 14 quadrillion mitochondria within you. All right, we need to wrap things up here, but I am so glad to be with all of you guys. Um, but I, I guess we need to just hit this one piece of data because it's so cool before we t turn you off um, out into the wild again. This is looking at uh, post-concussion syndrome. So this is prolonged post-concussive post syndromes. Uh, this study just came out in the last couple years here with VASPR. And what you're seeing here is a rapid shift or marked shift in the speed of recovery. Uh, and so the intervention period is just in this, few, this uh, bridge here. And so short intervention 
doesn't keep going for long term. And you can see this, uh, for, to get under 5% uh, of the population without symptoms, you're at about 60 days, 70 days, and you're about really never get the whole population under 10% there, but around 60 days. Over here, by 30 to 40 days, you got everybody down under that 10% range. So you, you cut in half the, the recovery phase of post-concussive syndromes by getting that lactate up for the brain. So the same lactates that's encouraging all of the endothelial function, all that down in, in the peripheral vasculature in your central cardiovascular system is also happening in the cerebral vascular system as you speed that, that metabolic recovery. This is the same study, just looking at improved quality of life. So the higher the scores, the more disrupted you are in severity and in fluctuations day to day of your functioning. And so you can see the severity of fluctuations and the overall scores falling there over time quality of life scores, uh, these are now higher the score, the better. This is kind of like your baseball game, instead of your golf game, higher the score, the better. This is looking at over a six week period. And so it's so exciting that you can do these short term interventions to reestablish normal systemic regenerative function throughout the system. So at our clinic, we've started integrating this stuff and sometimes you know all that science is really cool and it's interesting, but the, the human stories always make impact. And so I thought I'd just bring one, one cool story um, that we have going on right now. I've got a 63-year-old woman in my clinic that uh, was born with a, a genetic condition uh, called adult myodystrophy or uh, muscular dystrophy, which means that by the time she was about 22, she was rapidly losing skeletal muscle. And for the last couple of decades, she's pretty much limited to home because she's at such high fall risk because she has basically no skeletal muscle, especially in her lower extremities. It's pretty weird to see the tib fib and things like this in the leg, the bones. You can see both those. It's not like a calf muscle. You can see both the bones, no muscle. She happened to come in the day that Sebastian and Peter were installing the Vasper uh, at our center. And I said, well, I haven't even gotten on this crazy ass machine that's going on next door there. But after I've tried it once or twice, because I've never done anything in my clinic that I, I don't do anything to my patient that I don't my, do myself, which means we do almost nothing because I'm terrified of doing anything to myself. So. <laughs> um, it's actually less about terror and it's more about joy. I am so overjoyed that I was given all the God-given capacity for regeneration in my body. I'm always curious how to turn that on. And so I went and tried it. was pretty stunned by my first couple of times on Vasper. Called her up. I said, I think this is going to be safe for you to try. This woman, you can imagine, walking skeleton. We get her up on this machine. When you go visit, visit the VAS machine, imagine just getting into that situation if you had no skeletal muscle. Like the frailty of this woman and her courage to come and get on this thing that looks like some sort of aerospace equipment was so cool to just see her trusting, number one, and number two, just hoping in herself that she could do something. She'd been told since she was five, six years old that she had a, a genetic condition she could do nothing about. She's been on Vasper every two weeks because she lives a four hour drive away. So eight hour round trip. She comes twice a month all, all the way back. She's now three months in. She has a visible calf muscle for the first time since she was 20. That's resetting genetics. That's changing hope for humans. That's the opportunity to say, you know what? There's nothing impossible. As soon as somebody tells you there's a waste product or there's something that's impossible, rush there. You're going to find beauty there. You're going to find a miracle there. Because nature wanted you to know that she is a regenerative cycle and she knows nothing called death. She only knows life and she does it always more intelligent with every iteration. I'm excited to see your next iteration. I appreciate your patience. Thanks for being with me.